Uh, and welcome to the second of this year's Dalhousie Health Justice Institute seminar series. I'm Sheila Wildman, Associate Director of the Health Justice Institute. We meet in the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq, Olestigwe, and Passamaquoddy peoples, sovereign nations, holding inherent rights as the original peoples of these lands. We convene this series with respect for and a will to reflect on those inherent rights as well as our collective obligations under the Peace and Friendship Treaties in Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, which recognizes and affirms Aboriginal and treaty rights in Canada. We reflect, too, on the profound fact that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched this part of Mi'kma'ki, known as Nova Scotia, for over 400 years. But turning to today's guest, um, our speaker, Laura Johnson. Laura Johnson is a lawyer who works primarily in the areas of mental health law, disability rights, and human rights. Laura has represented clients with many different forms of disabilities and health issues in administrative and constitutional law cases before various tribunals and courts in Canada. As legal director of health justice, not to be confused with the Dalhousie Health Justice Institute, as they preceded us. So Health Justice is a provincial nonprofit organization in British Columbia. And I just encourage you to check out their website. Just Google Health Justice DC, and you'll see the range of uh, issues, reports, advocacy that Health Justice has done in that province. So as legal director of Health Justice, Laura conducts research law reform and systemic advocacy initiatives to improve access to justice and fairness for people whose rights are impacted by mental health law. Laura is also an adjunct professor at the Faculties of Law at the University of British Columbia and the University of Victoria. We're so excited to have Laura come uh, travel across the country to join us today to share her experience and insights with us. Please join me in welcoming Laura Johnson. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Hello, everyone. And thank you, uh, especially to the Dalhousie Health Justice Institute for having me out uh, here today. It's been a great opportunity to meet and connect further with folks here. Um, I just want to sort of start by acknowledging that in addition to being um, an uninvited guest on Mi'kma'ki, uh, I also am going to be talking today about laws that have been imposed through colonization in the area that's colonially called BC. And in BC, there are over 200 distinct First Nations. There are 39 chartered Métis communities. And of course, many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people living away from home. Um, I personally live and work on the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations um, as a settler there without the consent of those nations. And so I want to sort of situate myself in that, as well as the fact that uh, First Nations communities have their own laws and their own systems of health care and well-being um, that uh, existed before contact and colonization and exist to this day through a lot of resilience and resistance in those communities. Um, so what I'm talking about today is certainly a colonial legal order and not uh, reflective of those communities. Um, I've called this talk Imposing Health and Social Services Without Consent partly out of a resistance to calling it mental health law in BC. Uh, language is an imperfect art at best. But I find that mental health law in particular is not a good name for the substantive area of law that I conduct research in, that I practice in, that I teach in. And I invite questions like, if we're calling this mental health law, do these laws belong to people with mental health related disabilities? Uh, are they the authors or generators of these laws? And I would say profoundly in BC, that is not the case. Uh, similarly, I invite reflection on questions like, does the mental health law generate mental health? Does it help or harm mental health and well-being? I think those are more complicated answers uh, and, of course, could lend themselves to a lot of different perspectives. But often when I tell people that I practice mental health law, 
uh, the general understanding is that it's a status-based concept. Those are the laws for people with mental health issues. And I think that that's a fundamental misunderstanding for a few reasons. Uh, one of which is that many people who are impacted by what we call mental health laws do not have what is generally recognized to be a mental health diagnosis. In BC, people who are captured and impacted by mental health laws include people with dementia, people with brain injuries, people who use substances, people with intellectual or developmental disabilities, and a wide variety of other health and disability related issues taking place. And in addition, people with mental health diagnoses can and do intersect with many different areas of law. Um, they might have family law issues, they might have criminal law issues, they might have intellectual property law issues. And so I sort of start from a working and very imprecise definition of what I mean when I say mental health law today, which is a substantive area of law that governs coercive and involuntary interventions uh, of health and social services in the lives of people with disabilities and mental health or other kinds of health conditions because of their disability or their health condition, whether that's actual or perceived. And the questions that I'm really excited to get a chance to explore with this talk uh, are questions like, who are experts in this area of law? And how does our inclusion or welcoming in of expertise or our exclusion of different forms of expertise impact human rights, dignity, well-being and health of the people who are supposed to benefit from the laws in this area. I want to start us with a little bit of historical context in BC. Um, and I start with this sort of check-in question for yourself of when do you think BC has had the lowest level of procedural safeguards to detain people on the basis of their health or disability? And I've listed here some of the laws that have existed over uh, the history of uh, the colonial project of BC. And I'm going to use these words. I think they're important to use, even though I think that these will register as offensive to a lot of people uh, in our current uh, context. So was it in the 1872 Insane Asylum Act and Lunacy Jurisdiction Act? Was it the 1897 Hospitals for the Insane Act and Lunacy Act? The 1940 Mental Hospitals Act? or our current Mental Health Act. And while generally speaking, I think there's an assumption that over time, we've recognized more human rights. We've recognized the need to put safeguards in place when there's a deprivation of liberty or fundamental rights. And so surely our procedural safeguards must have also improved over time. In fact, the answer is our current Mental Health Act has much lower safeguards than all of those previous statutes. So in all of those, uh, pieces of legislation that existed before our current Mental Health Act, physicians were involved in making recommendations about a committal decision or an involuntary admission and detention decision, but the decision was ultimately made by the courts, made after a hearing that could consider not just the medical evidence, but also the rights of the individual in question, and there was judicial oversight over it. Now, in the early 20th century, when we still had the Mental Hospitals Act, there was a great deal of resistance uh, expressed by physicians about those oversights. And a lot of what I would call indignation expressed about why would judges and courts and lawyers wade in on something that should purely be a matter of medical discretion. And as a result of many factors, one of which was that lobbying attempt by physicians, uh, when our current Mental Health Act was passed in 1964, that was the first time in British Columbia that discretion was transferred completely away from the courts and entirely within the discretion of physicians. While our Mental Health Act has undergone a few tweaks around the edges, the primary framework and thrust of our Mental Health Act hasn't changed much since 1964. In fact, some of the language has remained exactly the same. To orient you to the first of the three sort of legislative frameworks I want to use as a basis for comparison and discussion today, uh, the Mental Health Act, just high level overview of what would otherwise be, you know, perhaps seven classes in my mental health law class. Um, to begin with, our Mental Health Act has no statutory purposes, no principles and no guidelines. 
The result is that interpretation really depends on the individual healthcare provider or in the rare instance that a court sees one, uh, the judge in question. There is authorization for police to apprehend anyone who's perceived to have a mental health issue uh, in conjunction with a safety risk and police can transport people to facilities. And there are currently over 75 facilities in BC where you can be detained under the Mental Health Act. This act applies at any age. There is no floor, there is no ceiling. A child of any age and an older adult of any age can be detained. And the involuntary admission and detention that is authorized is indefinite. There's no sort of max that you'll hit at which point in time you can no longer be detained. You can be detained for the rest of your life. There's no automatic hearing to review detention like there is in other detention contexts like immigration detention or criminal detention. A review only takes place if an individual who is detained asks for one and sustains that request for one up to a hearing, a problem that we'll turn to in a moment. Physicians have complete authority to release an individual from a facility on extended leave. And this is essentially our version of community treatment orders. The provision in our act allows physicians to impose conditions of leave. And those conditions generally include complying with involuntary psychiatric treatment, as well as attending appointments and being supervised by mental health teams. And if someone's suspected of violating a condition of leave, they can be recalled back to the detaining facility. And in a piece of legislation that has remained untouched since 1964, despite extensive efforts to change it, every involuntary patient is, during detention, subject to the direction and discipline of facility staff. There's no limitations on that. There's no criteria. There's no time limits. And there's no review process. This authorizes solitarily confining people in seclusion rooms. This authorizes mechanical restraints, tying people to their beds. This authorizes chemical restraints and environmental restraints, as well as treating day-to-day -day living conditions as privileges. So good behavior, you might get a grounds pass to get fresh air. Bad behavior, you'll have a privilege like wearing your own clothing or wearing um, sort of protective undergarments revoked. And uniquely in Canada, we have an override on healthcare consent rights that creates the deemed consent model. This says that once you're an involuntary patient, you are deemed to have provided your consent to any form of psychiatric treatment that the treatment team proposes. This essentially eliminates a request for consent and a provision of consent to a unilateral decision by the treatment team. Your capacity to make your treatment decision is completely irrelevant. There are people who are involuntarily treated who have capacity to make their own decisions, who aren't involved in that decision. There are people who don't have capacity to make their own treatment decisions and their loved ones or authorized decision makers are excluded from that decision as well. This deemed consent model has been the subject of a charter challenge in BC courts um, since 2016. Unfortunately, our BC government has been trying to get the case thrown out without a hearing uh, since that time by challenging public interest standing, which has sent it on a circuitous route up to the Supreme Court of Canada and back again, so our laws are still intact. And I want to address uh, sort of the myth of deinstitutionalization. I think that there's generally an understanding that in Canada, perhaps in the 90s or the early 2000s, we closed large-scale institutions and uh, placed people in community. I think BC has an incredibly unearned reputation for deinstitutionalization in particular. And what I want to show here is some very partial and inaccurate data, but the best data that we have. So in BC, our government doesn't track all of the detentions happening under the Mental Health Act. They only track the detentions happening in two classes of facilities, Schedule B and C facilities. They completely omit tracking detentions in Schedule A. They also don't track any detentions that take place in an emergency department in a facility that results in the release directly from emergency without further transfer. So what we have here is very inaccurate, underrepresentative data. The data is actually much larger. 
But I want to make the substantive point that, in fact, involuntary admission and detention under our Mental Health Act has been steadily climbing from the early 2000s, as you can see from this graph, um, getting close to 20,000 unique patients in 2020 and 2021. We lost all the data from 2018-19 and 2019-20 when the government decided to change their data tracking mechanisms, so we don't have a picture for those two years. Just to put this in context, some of you might have heard of Riverview being one of our sort of larger scale institutions that was closed in 2012 in BC. And often people start bandying about sort of big claims like we closed the doors of Riverview and everyone ended up out on the streets and we need to reopen institutions again in BC. That missing the fact that every resident at Riverview was transferred to another facility. No one was discharged to the street. And in fact, when Riverview was engaging in closure planning in 2000, there were less than 700 patients at Riverview, and we are up around 20,000 now. And then this data shows the number of detentions, not the number of people. And so you can see here a similar climb in our use of involuntary treatment, up to approximately 30,000 unique detentions for 20,000 people in the most recent year that we have data for. And I, I was sort of trying to look around at some of the detention numbers in Nova Scotia as a point of comparison. Of course, our population is larger, but from my very crude understanding, I think our population in British Columbia is five times as large as Nova Scotia's. So if you're looking for a quick comparison of how often your province might be using these mechanisms, um, if you divided 30,000 by five and you're still doing it more or less, I think that can be sort of an informative point. So a lot of experts call what we did in BC trans institutionalization rather than deinstitutionalization, which could maybe be something that our politicians could uh, take a little fact check on before they start speaking publicly. And then just to do a quick access to justice check. So we can see that these are some of the most significant deprivations of charter rights that we authorize in Canadian law. Um, sort of unreviewed, unchecked discretion to solitarily confine people, no healthcare consent rights, those are conditions that um, not even other detained populations experience. So how are we doing in the Oversight and Checks and Balances Department? Well, until this year, BC was one of the only provinces in Canada that had no independent rights information service for patients. So here in Nova Scotia, you have the patient's rights advocacy service or advisory service, I believe, advice service, PRAS. Um, that's something that we simply haven't had um, in comparison to other provinces. And after an enormous amount of advocacy effort from community and some independent offices like the Ombudsperson and the Representative for Children and Youth, uh, government has uh, agreed to create a rights information service for patients that's rolling out in BC currently with many bumps along the way, as I'm sure you can imagine. And those uh, rights information providers will come in and sit with involuntary patients uh, virtually largely because it's a virtually based service and tell them that they have rights uh, a very important uh, step in someone learning about and exercising their rights but one of the rights that they will tell folks they have a right to is the right to a lawyer you're detained you have a right to a lawyer in Canada and unfortunately there is no government funded program or service that has been created to provide legal advice to people who want to exercise their right to counsel when they're detained under the Mental Health Act. And there are some court applications that Mental Health Act detainees can make. Of course, they're entitled to habeas corpus as a detainee. They also have a statutory mechanism in our act. But while legal aid says it will consider and potentially fund applications for legal representation in court for a Mental Health Act detainee, they have not funded a single application in the last decade. We do have a tribunal that a detainee can request access to, uh, but since the onus is purely on the detainee to make the request and sustain that request up to their hearing, approximately two thirds of detainees who ask for a hearing withdraw their request to a hearing before the hearing takes place. This cancellation rate is for many reasons, one of which could be someone's discharge prior to their hearing, but in fact the majority of detainees are still detained when they withdraw their request for a hearing, and this can largely be attributed to pressure that is put on them by healthcare providers 
in detaining facilities where they're told things like, you're wasting everyone's time, don't you know how much this costs people to do, uh, you're going to lose anyways. Uh, inducements and threats are also pretty common. If you cancel your hearing, I'll put you on leave. If you don't cancel your hearing, I'll withdraw your privilege, like a smoke break on the grounds, for example. As a result, fewer than three of our documented detentions reach any form of independent hearing from a tribunal or court, and we know that the true picture of detention is much larger than what we have. Unfortunately as well, for someone who strives for access to justice improvements uh, for this population, uh, it gives me sort of no joy to report that the access to detention review has gone down as the detained population has gone up in recent years. So this is a metric we're actually losing ground on. I want to switch gears now to talk about a second statutory regime in British Columbia uh, the, under the Adult Guardianship Act. And this causes no end of confusion for generations of law students when I have to explain that adult guardianship isn't governed by the Adult Guardianship Act in BC. In fact, that's our Patients' Property Act that governs adult guardianship. Act. And the Adult Guardianship Act governs responses to abuse, neglect, and self-neglect concerns for adults who are unable to seek support and assistance because of a disability or health condition. And so this framework essentially designates or picks agencies that are responsible for investigating and responding to an adult when there's a concern of abuse, neglect, or self-neglect. And the agencies that have been picked in BC by regulation are our health authorities and Community Living BC. The Crown Corporation that's responsible for providing funding and services to adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So designated agencies can offer health and social services, the hope being that those health and social services can help support the adult respond to the abuse, neglect, or self-neglect that they're experiencing and that they're struggling to respond to themselves. But the statute says that if the adult decides not to accept the services proposed, they must not be provided unless a court order is obtained based on evidence that the adult is assessed as incapable of refusing the proposed services as well as a few other standards. When this law was rolled out in 2000, it was anticipated that there might be some court applications. And when there was a sort of absence of published court decisions of services being imposed against people's will, the community sort of inference was, great, this act is working on a voluntary basis. Adults are being connected with services that they want, that they're accepting, and that um, they are able to use to uh, ameliorate the conditions they're experiencing. And so it's just not necessary to go to court. And I see some smiles around the room. Perhaps that was a naive uh, inference on our part. But it actually turns out that something uh, much different was taking place. So I want to turn to the case AH and Fraser Health Authority and Community Living BC, two of our designated agencies. And I want to sort of preface this by saying that AH is a 39-year-old Indigenous woman at the time of this case who was removed from her home and transported uh, to a facility. Um, her, in her home, she lived with many members of her family on lands of her First Nation, where she'd lived for most of her life. And I want to pause and note that I was AH's counsel in this case. And while I'll only be discussing things that are part of the public record in court judgments, I do want to sort of add on to this that I've talked to uh, my former client about how she feels about me continuing to talk about this case. And I have sort of her comfort and consent to continue to talk about what happened in this case, uh, which was a significant uh, portion and incursion on her life. I think often in law, we focus on actors like judges or lawyers or members of the legal profession when we look at cases. I really want to encourage us to take a moment to look at um, the client AH herself when we think about this case. By the time that her habeas corpus and charter petition was heard, she was not in detention anymore. So this proceeded in large part on a moot basis. And I think that when litigants in an incredibly stressful and high-risk case 
choose to continue despite the fact that it's moot for them individually, I think that we can see incredible value to others in the precedent that it sets and in the way that this might prevent someone else from having an experience that the litigant had and the generosity that that involves from someone who may owe no generosity to the Canadian legal system. So AH was detained in three different hospitals and healthcare facilities for 11 months and 13 days. She kept being transferred to increasingly secure settings because she kept leaving. She would escape her detention and return home where she wanted to go and then was reapprehended and returned uh, each time. The conditions that she was detained under included uh, complete prohibition on using the phone for the most part and control over which numbers she called when she was permitted access to the phone. She was mechanically restrained to her bed at one point and was threatened with that at other points as well. She was denied access to the outdoors for fresh air. She asked for and asserted her right to counsel many times and was denied access to counsel. She was under a do not acknowledge protocol where when loved ones contacted a facility asking about her whereabouts, the facility staff were instructed to not acknowledge her presence in the facility. And she was subject to chemical sedation uh, throughout her uh, stay in hospital. Largely, what prompted the designated agencies to take action was a confluence of substance use factors, um, of concern that there was some self-neglect of sort of health and well-being, um, and of the fact that there was concern she might have been sexually exploited in order to obtain access to drugs or alcohol. There were many different concerns and assessments and diagnoses, and to some extent, uh, I'm not even sure how useful they are, but they ranged from brain injuries to FASD to mental health issues, etc. cetera. Um, but essentially, ultimately, the authorities in question concluded a lack of capacity to refuse um, these mechanisms at play in her life. Over nine months into her detention, she spoke to a lawyer for the first time, um, and we filed a petition for habeas corpus and other charter relief. And there had been no court authorization for anything that had happened to her. There'd been no court hearing. And so that prompted a very vivid question of how can you detain someone without any legal authorization? And the designated agency said, well, we have it. We have it in the emergency powers of this act. So underneath all of the provisions of this act down at the bottom, it says that in an emergency, if an adult appears to be incapable, designated agencies can take action without consent. And they give enumerated examples, provide emergency health care, make a referral to the public guardian and trustee about the adult's finances, and then down at the bottom, 59 e take any other emergency measure that's necessary to protect the adult from harm. And the designated agencies argued that this permitted unauthorized detention without any limitation or criteria. So this was what was argued in the habeas corpus on a moot basis. And I can go into an incredible amount of detail um, about arguments made on both sides. But essentially, uh, what the petitioner argued is this doesn't say detain. <laughs> it doesn't say involuntarily admit. And legislatures generally aren't coy. When they authorize detention, they generally say that you can involuntarily admit and detain someone, and they say what the periods are and what the criteria is. They build in a statutory mechanism for review, all of which we're missing here. Um, the designated agencies, of course, pointed to the any other measure, quite broad spectrum, and argued that if someone's living conditions through poverty, through risk of violence, through substance use, exposed a risk that could amount to a continuing state of emergency. The BC Supreme Court rejected the designated agency's arguments and said it was inexplicable that they had not applied to court for authorization for her detention over what amounted to nearly a year. And in addition to making declarations for habeas corpus, also made declarations under section 24.1 of the charter that her section 7, 9, 10a, b, and c rights had been violated in many reasons um, due to the conditions of her, her, her detention, that she hadn't been given reasons for her detention, that she hadn't been facilitated in exercising her right to counsel, that she'd been blocked in trying to exercise um, her rights and her residual liberty and security of the person. 
while the court said, certainly I can tell AH's detention was unlawful, there's no world in which an emergency could last for nearly a year, it said that it declined to find whether or not any form of emergency detention was authorized under 592E instead concluding it may be arguable that there is a brief temporary period pending a prompt application to provincial court provided the conditions of section 59.1 continue to be met but it's not necessary for me to decide whether it does so because this case doesn't arise out of a temporary brief detention answering some questions but leaving many others for another day for another habeas corpus perhaps Unfortunately, since that 2019 published decision, there has been no further guidance from our court. In the meantime, more evidence has continued to emerge from other impacted adults, from family members, and from healthcare providers who are reporting their concerns about how this provision is being used, that detentions continue under Section 59 without court authorization. Despite being informed about this case specifically and other cases more broadly, the BC government has taken no public action to address, to provide guidance on whether or not detention is permitted under these circumstances, to make any redress for unlawful detention, to make remedies for human rights violations that might have been occurring since 2000, or to prevent any future human rights violations. In November of last year, our BC Human Rights Commissioner announced it was launching an inquiry into 59 and the detentions under that act. Uh, we look forward to the results of that inquiry coming out potentially before the end of the year. And then the third legislative structure I just want to introduce us briefly to is under our Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act. As a basic overview, this essentially governs how healthcare providers and care facility managers can obtain consent from adults for proposed healthcare or for proposed care facility admission. It sets out a structure for, you know, presuming an adult is capable of making their own decision, if there's capacity concerns, how you assess that capacity, if someone is found not to have capacity to make the decision, who their supported and substitute decision makers are, either authorized through representation agreements or court orders or through a temporary substitute decision making uh, system. And under that act, there's also an emergency provision, section 12, which authorizes healthcare providers to provide healthcare to an adult without consent if certain conditions are met. That requires a necessity to act without delay to preserve life or to prevent significant pain. Um, that there has to be an appearance of incapacity, but presumably no time to actually assess capacity, and that there's no available supported or substitute decision maker available at that time. And only recently, uh, evidence began to emerge that healthcare providers have also relied on Section 12 of this Act to detain individuals and to provide involuntary treatment, primarily for people who are experiencing a substance use related health crisis. So for people who've experienced an overdose, for example, um, an all too chillingly common experience in BC with our toxic drug supply crisis. And while this act also doesn't say detention and doesn't say involuntary admission and doesn't set out periods or any sort of structure, um, this has been used um, for detention and involuntary treatment as well for people using substances. To touch base briefly on the access to justice questions, um, as grim as we may have found uh, my access to justice metrics for the Mental Health Act, it was actually quite a rosy picture when compared to people experiencing detention or involuntary treatment under this act. So detainees under the Adult Guardianship Act and the Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act are not eligible for the newly unfolding independent rights information service available for Mental Health Act detainees. The government has made eligibility for that contingent on being detained under the Mental Health Act. In addition, there is no established program or service that is tailored to Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act detainees or Adult Guardianship Act detainees. Some individuals in detention have been able to find one-off representation here and there from either nonprofit lawyers or legal aid lawyers, but access to counsel has been an extraordinary challenge for this population. There is no tribunal that oversees detentions under either of these statutory systems. 
and there has been no published habeas corpus decision since the 2019 AH decision, after which we hoped there would be more clarity um, coming from our courts. That's of course not to say that that hasn't been tried, um, and perhaps the situation was resolved uh, prior to coming to hearing, or it didn't result in a published judgment, but nothing published that could support a precedent or guidance in this area. Part of the extreme challenge with um, bringing habeas corpus, as anyone who works in detention populations will understand, is that the detaining facility can change someone's detention status just overnight and moot out an issue. And not every litigant wants to take on their healthcare system that they might have to access again in the future um, through sort of more adversarial litigation. So with that, I have created a little chart here um, that puts some of the indicia of rights protections for detained populations that we might expect from international human rights law from charter law. So things like detention periods and criteria, healthcare consent rights, right to access visitors, protection from restraint use as a form of discipline. And I don't sort of need to get us bogged down in the details. I think we can see things like in some ways our Mental Health Act is at least providing some clarity. It says you can detain someone in express terms. It says what the periods and the criteria are unlike AGA Section 59 or Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act Section 12. In other ways, though, our Mental Health Act is falling short. A detainee under the Section 59 provision of the Adult Guardianship Act has healthcare consent rights still intact, whereas a Mental Health Act detainee does not. Largely, what I want to demonstrate with this chart is just the complete scattershot array of rights protections across any of these regimes. And I think while we would like to present these as discrete, siloed systems that work differently. These are detention formats that are impacting the same adults, either simultaneously or sequentially, or being combined to result in prolonged detention. We've seen many examples of an adult, for example, being discharged under the Mental Health Act, only to not be discharged because now they're under the emergency section 59 provision of the Adult Guardianship Act. And so these are not quite as discreet as we might think on the face of these statutes. The other thing I want us to draw from this is while they might look different on the surface, I actually think there's a common denominator here across all three legislative schemes. And I think that is that it centers the expertise of the healthcare system and of the healthcare providers who work in it as the people who should be making the decisions for people experiencing some of these health or disability related crises. I think we can also see that there are two particularly strong exclusions of forms of expertise here, one being law and legal service providers. Certainly these systems are not doing anything um, to protect access to fair procedure, access to a legal advocate or a lawyer to work alongside you to make sure you understand and can exercise your rights. I think as well, these systems are excluding the expertise of the individuals most directly impacted. Detention by its nature is exclusionary of an individual's lived experience expertise. If someone wanted to be in hospital or wanted to be in the facility and provided consent, that's their choice. And detention by its nature says that that person can't be trusted to make that decision for themselves, but instead a healthcare provider is making that decision for them. So we can turn also to look at where the BC government sees expertise. And I uh, want to emphasize the fact that uh, we have, for many years, had a Ministry of Health that is supposed to provide leadership to our health authorities and our healthcare system that they have the order in council that makes them responsible for statutes like the Mental Health Act. Despite the existence of that ministry, following a change in government in 2017, a new ministry was created, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions in BC. And that didn't result in any sort of diminishment of the responsibilities or role of the Ministry of Health. It just added another ministry on top of the situation. And to this day, the Ministry of Health is still responsible for the Mental Health Act, not the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. To add to these layers, in June of this year, our Premier created a new special advisor, which was an appointment directly to the Premier's office, 
This advisor was created um, to improve care for people with complex mental health and addiction challenges. And in doing so, the Premier appointed a psychiatrist as the special advisor on mental health law and policy for our province. I think then you can see how challenging it might be as someone with lived experience of these laws who wants to talk to their lawmakers about them, as a family member who's concerned about our province and the availability of services, as someone who works in community who wants to talk to government, who do you talk to? The Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, or the Special Advisor, now responsible for mental health and addictions policy in our province. And that sort of fracturing of the source of authority has made it incredibly challenging to know who is accountable and who is providing leadership in the province. Some of you might have been seeing as well the cluster of campaign announcements that have been coming out of BC. We've been in the midst of a very heated provincial election, the results of which will become clear tomorrow. So everybody send warm wishes to BC. Um, but we saw here that a big focal point was announcements from both major parties um, running for government to expand the use of detention and involuntary treatment for people with mental health and substance use health challenges in particular. I've put a couple examples here on the slide. September 11th, um, the Conservative Party announcing low secure units um, and promising the introduction of compassionate intervention legislation. They will introduce laws to allow involuntary treatment for those at serious risk due to addiction, including youth and adults. Never mind the fact that our Mental Health Act is already being used for this purpose. One in five people detained under our Mental Health Act are being detained for a substance use related diagnosis, and it applies to youth and adults. Um, so not entirely sure what that promises. And then days later, on the 15th, um, the NDP announced high secure facilities. Um, again, there are more than 75 very secure facilities in BC where people are detained and provided involuntary treatment already. So it's not entirely clear what the discrepancy or issue is with these low secure and high secure. Um, but the NDP are uh, outgoing government also promising that if re-elected they will not only provide policy guidance to ensure that our existing laws are used for involuntary treatment, they will also introduce new laws to expand um, involuntary treatment, none of which was done with any form of engagement of any mental health law experts, of any people with lived experience, of any member of the public to our knowledge. So I want to wrap us up then and, and save quite a bit of time for us to have a discussion. I've made an attempt here, I was sharing with Sheila, at um, some visual or artistic demonstration here. And I will preface that by saying I'm a very language-based person. And I think you'll all see in a moment how rudimentary my art skills are. Um, but if we imagine that um, we want to take an approach of centering a person who is having a health crisis, or a disability-related crisis. Um, I want then for us to talk about what is the way that we can surround um, that individual with supports. And I think that in many ways, BC is a case study for what happens when one form of expertise is completely centered for an individual with a mental health or substance use or disability-related uh, crisis. And I think what we can see is that laws and policies in our province um, have very much centered uh, medical approaches, healthcare provider approaches. In fact, I would argue, have almost completely subsumed this individual behind health needs. And I think to some extent, you know, very well-meaning anti-stigma campaigns that have really drilled home the message of mental health is a health problem and the primacy of the need for health and social services, perhaps even as an alternative to other forms of the state, um, have contributed to a situation where largely people are seen as having a health need and therefore need health care providers. And when I suggest to people that someone having a mental health crisis has legal needs and might need a legal service provider, generally speaking, people look at me as though I said that my car was having engine trouble and I'm taking it to a chiropractor. It's just not seen as a particularly relevant form of expertise for someone in that crisis. And 
I think that when we exclude law, when we exclude fair process and judicial interpretation, when we exclude a legal advocate who can walk alongside someone and help them advocate for their rights, we are also implicitly saying that that person is not a rights bearer, that they don't have access to legal rights that they could exercise in that moment. And I think that that's a particularly chilling um, point that we've arrived at um, in an exceptional way, I think, in BC and to some extent elsewhere. And what I'd like to suggest instead is that what we all need to be well, not just folks who are having a health crisis or a disability-related crisis, is actually multiple forms of expertise. I'm not going to argue that people with uh, mental health conditions or people with disabilities don't need access to health care. Of course they do. We all need access to effective and safe and uh, available health care services. I think in addition, we all need safe housing to live in and we need access to meaningful nutrition and social connection, culture and ceremony, exercise, the outdoors, and law and legal service providers. And while I think that we could sort of delve into the many different forms of expertise that might support someone to live their best life and most sort of well and meaningful and fulfilling life, there's two that I want to wrap us up on in particular that I see as acutely missing in the BC context. One is I'd like to make the case for legal expertise mattering. Um, probably not too much of a contentious claim in a law school setting, but I can assure you it is in other settings I speak at. Um, I really do think that legal rights and having access to a fair process where your voice can be heard, having a legal advocate whose loyalty is completely to you and your vision alone for what your rights look like, having court interpretation of how healthcare providers are interpreting laws and guidance have a really critical role to play at the intersection of health and social services and the people who receive those services, most acutely when those services are being imposed against that individual's will. And I've put on the slide here a quote from at the time, she was Susan Fraser, a lawyer in Ontario. Um, now she's Justice Susan Fraser. Um, that when I tell people that I represent mad people, I am often asked, how do you get instructions? And to step out of uh, Justice Fraser's quote for a moment, I can't tell you how often I'm asked this when I say that I represent people impacted by mental health laws. It's usually followed up by some form of how do you talk to those people? Um, as well as how could they have any ideas for their legal case. And I really just think that this speaks to how embedded it is culturally, this concept that someone who sought a legal service provider who has their own goals and ideas for how they want these services to be playing out um, can be so deeply assumed to lack any capacity to participate in advancing their own rights. And then to step back into Justice Fraser's quote, um, the answer is simple, from my clients. Survivors of the mental health system have been analyzed, institutionalized, and psychiatrized. On the days they meet with me, they get to be in control. And I think really speaking to that profound, therapeutic, human rights promoting, but also health promoting dignity that can come from having access to someone who isn't trying to convince you of anything, who doesn't have an agenda with you, but is just helping you promote your vision of your rights. And then finally, I want to make the case for lived experience expertise. I think profoundly that people are experts on their own lives, that we all have insights and perspectives onto the values, onto the needs that we have, um, onto what kind of help that we need. And here I've put a quote from Colin Gableman, who was the Attorney General in 1995, who was talking about actually the Adult Guardianship Act law reform process, which was deeply informed by the people who would be most directly impacted. And there he said, the legislation was important, but hearing the voices of those most affected by the legislation as it is implemented is even more important. It is no longer acceptable for professionals or government to tell people what is good for them. I wanted to end us here because I think that this really counters the presumption that, oh, you know, with time, we're gradually becoming more progressive and we are certainly listening more carefully to the voices of people who have lived experience. Uh, I think in BC, we've experienced a deep backslide that in the mid 90s, our government was saying, this isn't okay anymore. Government and professionals can't tell people what's good for them.
And when you fast forward to 30 years later, we've seen nothing but examples of that from our law and from our policy in BC. I think it sort of speaks to the importance of us demanding from our lawmakers, from our policymakers, that they do listen and center the voices of people with lived experience. I, I think it also really underscores how hard we have to fight for that, how hard we have to advocate for that, and, and how we can model that as well, how we can look around the rooms that we're in, in law schools, in med schools, in academic settings, in community settings, in legal aid settings, and ask how are there ways that we can better center the voices of people with lived experience in the work that we're doing as well. So I think with that, I've reached my time, and I'd like to end us there and open us up for questions, if that's okay. Okay, so the, the question is essentially, why is BC so bad? Um, what is going on contextually that has allowed this to flourish? And I gotta tell you, I've been asked this question so many times, and I don't have a satisfactory answer for it. I think that something that's been missing is a systemic advocacy voice. Um, my organization, the nonprofit Health Justice, was founded in 2020, in part in recognition of this sort of vacuum of there being a voice of systemic advocacy on mental health that was rights-based, that was based around people with lived experience. Um, our organization has uh, brought together uh, lived experience experts and legal experts and human rights experts to try to create this advocacy voice. But you know, four years isn't very long in the arc of time. Um, and I can tell you, while we engage in very strenuous efforts to try to have conversations with our government about these problems, um, so far there has been little to no responsiveness or willingness to engage. I think the other sort of absence here is um, a sort of healthy mental health bar that's getting litigation going. There was a while when I was practicing um, that people used to be saying something along the lines of, oh, you're the only mental health lawyer in BC, and isn't that funny? But I also think that's a deep problem. I, you know, I should not have been the only mental health lawyer in BC, not with the volume and population that we were experiencing. Um, and cases I was bringing, it, you know, the court registry didn't know what was happening. Why are you filing a habeas corpus? You're in the civil registry, go to the criminal registry. And I had to sort of explain to them, you know, detention means habeas corpus, but it's civil. Well, if they're detained, it's not civil, but if it's civil, it's, we had sort of a who's on first conversation because it was just so anathema to them that someone could be exercising habeas corpus in civil detention. And, uh, you know, I have to say that speaks volumes. There's profoundly, by far and away, more civil detainees in our province than criminal detainees. Um, and our, there's no sort of templates, there's no precedents, there's no uh, sort of movement from the legal sphere either. Of course, there's been like individual cases and attempts here and there, little spurts of energy, but I think two things that have really been lacking is systemic advocacy grounded in lived experience and any sort of litigation efforts in a sustained way. Yeah, 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 just some really effective input from someone who practices as a social worker in BC, I think pointing to a really big flaw in our law, which is that a lot of statutes will have a provision that says that um, you can't make access to a service contingent on having involuntary status under this law. I can't quite remember from my cross-Canada research if um, IPTA in Nova Scotia has that provision, but many statutes do, and I think it sounds like a throwaway, like, well, of course we wouldn't require someone to be involuntary, but in BC, we have completely tied access to services to being involuntary. And while we saw those involuntary numbers climbing, I didn't map this onto the chart for sort of brevity's sake, but the voluntary numbers were going down at the same time. And so you can see this is not just a funding thing. It costs the same amount to have someone in an acute care bed voluntarily and involuntarily. This is a cultural approach that our healthcare systems are taking of, you know, if you're unwell enough, if you're unhealthy or bad enough, to need admission to hospital, then you have to be an involuntary patient. It's kind of an unwillingness to work with people where they're at or in an involuntary way. And so I think as the cultural attitude increases of you can't get on a mental health team roster, you can't get admission to a mental health unit, you can't get access to diversionary programs unless you're involuntary, so too does the sort of feed and the proliferation of the involuntary mechanisms of the law.
Yeah, it's a great question about some of the sort of financial ties or connections to keeping someone involuntary. And, and then I think also a second part to the question, which is how do we get access to the supports that someone might need that they might not only, they might not get unless they're in a facility like setting. Um, yes, I think there are some, disturbing financial connections to detention decisions. A uh, key one in BC, for example, being that we have a fee guide for physicians who get paid for making an involuntary admission decision and completing the certificates. Um, it's not to say they don't get paid other ways for providing other services, but I think worth a question. You know, I, physicians, I know because I, I train them often, think of themselves largely as service providers. They think of themselves as clinicians. They don't think of themselves as statutory decision makers acting on behalf of the Canadian state in an administrative system, though they are. Um, and I think having a financial tie to any decision regarding someone's rights is deeply dangerous. Um, though I don't think it's the only thing accounting for the rise in detention numbers. And, and then similarly, I, I think to your point about sometimes when someone is really not well and they, they need to be surrounded by supports, sometimes the only way to get access to that is in a facility. And I think that's part of the problem, right? Where's the other pieces of my clip art on that um, you know, slide that are missing in community? Why can't we surround someone by, with supports in community? It is actually far more cost effective to send a social worker even 24 hours a day on rotating shifts to someone in community than it is to institutionalize someone in an acute care bed. That costs thousands of dollars every day. And so it's not just a resource question, it's an imagination question. And I think that we have put down our imagination tools about how best to support people when it comes to thinking outside of the systems that we've had in place for sort of hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question about sort of the block in the flow of information to someone when they've been detained about their rights. And it's, it's so critical. Um, the ombudsperson's report that I referenced the data from did a bit of an audit that checked are the healthcare providers completing the five basic certificates that are legally required to complete when you detain someone? And these do very rudimentary things. They give someone the reasons for their detention. Why are you here? They let them pick a loved one to inform this is happening to them and tell that loved one. And they tell them about their rights. And those forms were completed 28% of the time for the detentions that were audited, which means it's actually the vast majority of detainees who are experiencing charter rights violations and human rights violations. It, it reminds me of, um, there is a, a quote by the human rights lawyer Lex Gill on the CBC Ideas podcast recently uh, from a lecture in the Crow Theater um, where she said, the injustice is so big it's invisible. And, and I think that that's really vivid here. Like it's, it's rare that you'll find a system that is operating minority compliance. And despite years of concerted effort to increase those compliance ratings, at the last investigative check-in, they were up to 40% or something. Like it's still the vast majority of detainees are not being informed of their rights. And it's a charter obligation on any detaining authority that when you detain someone, you notify them they have rights. And so that part of our system is broken. And then on top of that, the rest of Canada has figured out what has taken us a long time in BC to figure out, which is because there's problems in ensuring that detaining facility staff members inform someone of their rights, you have to send someone independent in. You have to have someone independent available. And because we've been missing so many pieces in that chain, it's um, a very upstream problem when the downstream effect might be zero court cases. And that's certainly what we're seeing. But as you've sort of vividly demonstrated, it's it, how is a lawyer supposed to get connected with a detainee? How are they supposed to know there's a rights violation? How is that detainee supposed to know that they have rights when so many steps along the way have been skipped? Yeah, it's a comment or question about the relationship between the voluntary and the involuntary admissions and how one drives the other, perhaps. And yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to have to borrow from the expertise of um, folks with lived experience who will say quite plainly that the if you know you need to be in hospital, if you know you're not well and you're not safe on your own right now, the best thing to do is go tell a healthcare provider, I don't need to be in hospital, I'm fine. Because you can sort of trick the system into thinking you're severely ill enough that you're lacking insight into the fact that you do need to be in hospital and so then you'll be involuntarily admitted, right? 
yeah, yeah, no, no, this isn't sort of legal expertise. This is lived experience expertise of folks going to emergency and saying, I'm not okay. I need, I need help right now. I need to be here and then being turned away. Because if you go voluntarily and say, I would like this help, there's sort of this perception of, well, we know better than you. And you're, so you must be wrong that you need to be here. And if you're voluntarily asking for help, that means you have insight into the fact that you need the help. So then you're not severely ill enough, so we're going to reject you. But if you say you don't need to be here, again, I know better than you about what you need. And so you do need to be here. And so I, I know folks who lie to their healthcare providers to induce them to use the paternalistic option of involuntary admission and detention uh, just to get access to the help they need. I mean, that is, that is like blood curdlingly absurd. You know, that we're at a point in time in our system where people know they have to lie to their care providers who they probably need to be completely honest with to get effective help from just to get access to what they need. So, I mean, there, there are bed shortages for sure. We have not exhausted the provision of voluntary care in BC by any stretch of the imagination. And I sort of feel like asking people who are asking for expansion of involuntary care, you know, how about we try expanding voluntary care first um, and see if that doesn't work and then let's you know, unpin this pin in your idea. But I do think it's more than just funding and more than just the availability of beds. I do think it's a cultural attitude of people don't know what's best for them. Health does know what's best for them. And it's really hard to get access to the help that people know that they need sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, a comment about really emphasizing that rights deprivation on the grounds of disabilities is a human rights protected characteristic that we should be acting with outrage about undeniably um, and what sort of litigation has been um, contemplated to try to sort of enforce those human rights. I mean, the, the short of it is, I, I can name a few cases that have tried and failed. Um, in particular, perhaps I could talk about our human rights tribunal where I wrote a paper um, recently that summarized that um, there have been several human rights complaints filed by people who've been detained under the Mental Health Act, every single one of which was dismissed without a hearing at a preliminary application that uh, allows our tribunal to throw cases out without a hearing if there's no chance of success. And largely the tribunal members making those decisions have drawn conclusions like, well, I, I know you were denied a visit with your daughter because of your daughter's age, family status. <laughs> I know you were denied access to the grounds, even though you're an Indigenous person and nature-based healing might be important for you, or I know you were denied access to smoking breaks. You know, all of these are very integrated intersectional human rights concerns. And the conclusion that was drawn was, but this just seems like the conditions that all Mental Health Act patients experience, not just you, you weren't being singled out. And of course, that's, that's sort of like 101 human rights, I think, that we learn in law school that, you know, direct discrimination is only one form of discrimination and a, a blanket policy that applies to everybody can, of course, have adverse impacts on some communities more than others. And we seem to have lost that thought process when it comes to, well, they were being taken care of in the hospital. And so those are the conditions that have to be in place in the hospital. I'm not going to question the healthcare providers. Again, I see a lot of deference to the health system there, but no successful human rights complaints yet. Yeah, do you want to come to BC and try some, maybe? Show us how it's done. <laughs> we would be much appreciated. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'll contextualize that by saying that in our provincial election, uh, our Conservative and NDP party are polling neck and neck, like completely equivalent. And so I think we're seeing positions out of some parties that we may not have at other points in time in history. Um, I think a lot of the political will is coming from fear-mongering, from uh, highly publicized incidents of violence, where people are either assuming inaccurately or accurately that someone has a health or disability related issue that's causing the violence. And I think we still really haven't separated out this idea of mentally unwell people are more likely to be dangerous or violent even though statistics show us again and again that is absolutely not true. People with mental health concerns are more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. But there have been a few highly publicized sort of public attacks um, where politicians, I think, are playing political football by stoking public fear and then saying, I have the solution. 
we're also just years and years and years into a public health emergency of overdose deaths. And that has not, there's, there's no one in BC who hasn't been impacted by that. And that's particularly acute for indigenous communities or racialized communities, uh, and particularly acute for young people. And so that's been devastating. And the solutions to that are something that have been hotly contested from sort of more harm reduction approaches to more law and order approaches. And I think that what we've seen in recent months is a real scaling back of harm reduction approaches and a real ratcheting up of detention approaches. With that, are we going to leave it there? Just thank you. Okay. Uh, although I know we all, or at least those of us who have a little more time than one minute, would love to stay uh, longer and continue a conversation with you, Laura. Um, I wish that, uh, that you were closer at hand. We are, you know, a coast away, but um, I feel that this discussion that you've instigated among us is one of the sort of most robust that, that I've experienced around mental health law detention or psychiatric detention in this province in a long while. And if I were to just make you know, one last word, it's that while our laws um, are comparatively, I think, more robust, there are aspects of our laws that are absolutely on par with what's being described. And I'll give you one example. Having visited a friend who was at the Abbey Lane in their therapeutic quiet uh, room recently, that room is akin to a solitary confinement room. And as uh, Laura said, under our mental health law, as she said of uh, BC's law, there's no time cap, there's no mandatory oversight, there's no process of review, there's no process whereby a person is advised of their right to counsel. And myself as a person coming as a friend with an appointment with that person was told, sorry, we have a policy that says you're not allowed to even speak through the door and say you're here. And I could hear the person calling out from that room. That feeling of inaccessibility of a person in gross distress, like dire distress, is a feeling I want all of us to carry with us as we think about the, the access to justice problems that Laura has described, and not just other than to be seen in a particular political yeah. moment, but something that is, as you've said, invisible to us because it's so, uh, just sort of so massive and difficult to appreciate what kind of legal emergency, slow violence this is. We live, uh, uh, you know, we just continue to live that, you know, um, is, I guess, kind of depressing last <laughs> word, uh, but also just profound gratitude is the last thing that I want to say um, to Laura. Please join me again in thanking Laura. Johnson.